All right, starting a little late, bummer. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, um, Thursday uh, I will be off campus, so I posted a lecture. Notice Thursday is our lecture 21, but on the notes it's lecture 20, so don't get confused. Okay. So some review, quiz, ooh, quiz stuff. We kind of went over this last time. Um, and also for the lab, again, tomorrow, I will be off campus again. So, of course, you should all be set for that. Right? Any questions in the lab? Where's the... Uh, uh, yeah. No? Is he still in the lab? Okay. Yeah. I still see him in the lab. All right. Okay. Um, let's uh, get going. Today we're going to discuss diff amps, and you've already seen diff amps because that was chat example 9.5. So I'm going to do the DC behavior. We're going to do simulations, and we're going to look at the operation. Before I do that, there was a question on one of the homework problems. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know how to set it up because of poor instruction. I, I keep thinking maybe I should switch to Apple, but no, no. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that just makes more headaches. Yeah, Stay yeah, strong. Stay strong. But I use Apple TV every day. And Netflix and YouTube. I mean, That's how I stay up on movie. pop culture. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? See, you know, this is a good reason why when you're losing, you don't bet more. <laughs> right? It yeah, it just gets worse and worse. You start having problems, you show up late to class, your internet doesn't work, your camera doesn't focus, the recorder doesn't work, and you have to start it three times. And then you just know when you start having problems, you expect more so you don't get frustrated. Car starts to die, you can have another problem, then another problem. It is what it is. No, you never buy when it's dipping down. You're buying on the way down. No. You sell as it's going up. No, you buy when it's been sitting there for a long time at a reasonable price. Yeah. You never buy when they're going down, trust me. Yeah. Kramer. <laughs> uh, and see, I can. This thing's not even working. Let's see how long it takes to respond. You guys sure you like all this computer stuff? Come on. You know what you should do for us? <laughs> what? Well, what else should I do for you? Why? What's that? Let's talk about that after class and get back on the example here since we're already burning time. 2125, use spice to illustrate Miller effect, show AC responses, input pull, output pull, and the zero that is neglected. Uh, voltage control, voltage source. All right, so let's go look at the, uh, no, I don't want that. Let's go look at, maybe that's why it was slowing down, damn Apple, quick time. Let's go look at the, the basic, uh, equation for Miller effect. And did it say show a zero? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. So we can do this several ways. I'm going to just take it literally as the problem mass and show with a voltage source. So <clears throat> if I look at this circuit right here, this is my input. This is my Miller capacitance. This I'm going to replace with the voltage control voltage source because that's what it said to use. And there's my load capacitance. So I'm going to do this real quick, okay? <clears throat> so I, I'll draw this and you tell me if it makes sense. And I'll draw an equivalent schematic then too. I'll just pick 100. Oops. Uh, that's a resistor, I think. Um, uh, let me think for a sec. Should be like that. Let me look at the model here. Yeah, that's right. So when you go to the following, I think I'm going to start having my quizzes at the beginning of class to correct some behavior when I do the following. And I have a capacitor drawn here. And I ask, OK, where's the port? That's the same as having the capacitor drawn out here. So when I thevenize, I thevenize at these two points, or I thevenize at these two points. Okay, And uh, so when I draw the capacitor, it needs to go on this side of the resistor when I thevenize these. Does everybody follow that? Does that make sense? Because this is my output. It's not inside the Thevenin equivalent. It's not over here when I draw the capacitor. Okay, so when I have this circuit, this is V out, I'll be able to show the uh, Miller's theorem and all that stuff, the input pole. What did it ask for? Input pole? Yeah. Input pole, output pole, and the voltage. So what's the other thing to get the input pole that we need? Because this is the output pole. This will be the zero. Yeah, we need a resistance here. And this will be able to do it. Anybody disagree? Does everybody see why we needed that? Yeah, because you need to have some... Okay, this is the way I think. If I don't have a resistance, I can supply infinite charge with this voltage source in spice. Nothing slows me down, so I have no input pole. So I need that resistance to limit how fast I can charge the input. Here's my mill. I'm going to have my input and output shorting together. Because at high frequencies, the capacitor's there. And then I'm going to have a time constant associated there. Do I need to spice this, or can we move on? Can you put the, like, the voltage control voltage source in instead of the... Yeah, I just thevenized the Norton source. So I just, I just got confused. Doing Norton and Thevenin should be like second nature. It should be boom, 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 boom. Yeah, just the voltage control voltage source like, threw me off because, like, you know, that. Well, but that source that we, is a uh, current control, or uh, a voltage control current source, this source here, right? That's a current, or I mean, a voltage controlled current source. So I just didn't draw the two arrows going over here to the voltage VN or oh, VGS. So Thevenized these yeah. two. Oh, okay. Just okay. changed the voltage source to GM1 R out, and then the controlling voltage is these two, and the resistance is here. Okay. I'd rather not burn class time simulating this. If you go back and simulate it and it doesn't work, I'll say you did something wrong, but we can do it in <laughs> class then. Okay, any questions? 14? Does that make you mad? I look at 
problems that I work problems in class makes me mad. Just kidding. Come on. Wait a sec. All right, I'll do this real quick, but I want to point something out. You see this circuit? Go back to here. No, do I ever say it's in the book? Do I ever say, no, that's in the book, just look at the book. If I, you said, how do you do example 21.2, then I would say it's in the book, you know. But look at this. And isn't that, was well, is it the same? All right, well, you get another one next time. This one's a little easier, I think. So we need to find all the voltages. Oh, we did this last time. We did this circuit. I do, but I'll do it again. Are you sure you're using the videos? Because I'm. you see how much pain I'm going through putting these up? You don't care. <laughs> Didn't even look at the notes. <laughs> I honestly, do, I honestly don't know if you guys use the videos because I can't imagine when I was in school looking at a lecture twice. That would be painful to me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's his old homework. You just put your homework in. He saves them. Killing me, man. Here, why don't you put it over there and I'll get it. <laughs> so I understand that the top part is the R out from the factory. Wait, hold on. Let me explain it, right? And this is VN. And so what is this node called? VD. This is V out. And what other things did it ask for besides V out over V1, VN or VD1 over V1? V out yeah, over so V1. V out over oh, V1. all right. Okay, so let's do the first part easy. What's the current that flows in there? VMVI. Should everybody agree with that? What's the AC voltage there? What's the current that flows in here? So how is that related to the VGS? Isn't VGS2 zero minus VD1? And so what is V what is uh, VD1 equal to? Doesn't this sound familiar? Okay, so what is VD1 over VD VN? Was that challenging? I, I was actually sweating bullets because my sin were backwards. I, I calculated it correctly, but weird. But wait, when you plot this, it's going to show 1, right? Because the phase shift is 180. So. Yeah. I got the correct phase shift, it's just uh, my gain was incorrect. It'll be slightly less than 1 because this one has body effect. Yeah. So if you remove the body effect, it'll be 1. Yeah. yeah, it's like 0.8, something like that. Now, what's V out then? What is V out over V in? This is in the book, too. <laughs> V out over VN, should I write it? V out over VN is minus GMR out cascode P in parallel with R out cascode N. Unreasonable problem. You know, showing up to class late like I did today is a slippery slope. You got to make sure you don't get into bad habits. I showed up late too. Not as late as you there, poor coop, but late. Five minutes. No, I showed up on time actually. It just takes me time to set up the That's video. Fine. I know, on time is late. <laughs> Honestly, that's one thing being successful is try to be always on time or early. 
you work with people that are really busy and all that, and they make really, you know, good effort to show up on time and be reliable. I mean, really busy. They cut the meeting off. This is when we're meeting. This is when we go. And this is when we show up. So when I show up late, I don't like it. Or I show up on time, I don't like it. I want to be early. Anyway, any other questions on this? Yes? I think the last problem. What's the last problem? I already did that one. You have to review the video. Do you ever watch the videos? Yeah, I have to. All right. That didn't answer my question, but... I, I didn't hear. You do watch them? Yes, I have to. All right. Any other questions? Was the homework reasonable? The first half wasn't. That means it was easy the, in my mind. The first half and last problem. The first half and the last problem were easy? Oh, yeah, but 14 and um, 21 were hard. What about oh, next... Yeah, what about next Tuesday's homework? Has anybody looked at that? Really? <laughs> Let's look. <laughs> oh, wrong button. You're killing me. Has anybody? Just go home and try to start again next week. I'm assuming that it's fine. Honestly, this is what I think every time this happens. Why aren't I tethering my phone to the computer and bypassing you in LVs? Just say that every time you have this. Because if you only rely on yourself, you tend to have less problems than relying on others. That's very true. All right. Okay, so let's talk about diff amps. So I want to do a uh, qualitative overview to begin with so that you can answer qualitative questions about diff amps, because diff amps are the input of op amps. So they're a basic building block in analog design, and they're used everywhere, because you know how we've been using big resistors and big capacitors? When you use diff amps, you don't have to use those. So it allows you to DC couple your circuits. Also, for your projects, if there's requirements on the output swing, when you take your output swing and you feed it back to the input of the op amp, the input of the op amp is a diff amp. And if you have requirements on output swing, you will know how but your output swing is going to be the same as your input swing. Now you know how to design the, your diff amp to meet the output swing requirements. And I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to be able to explain it to you. If somebody's taking circuits and they ask you, why do we always assume that the two inputs are the same voltage. Can everybody explain why? Can everybody explain why? Can you say in very simple terms, why do these have to be the same? And the answer is, let's assume, let's go look at this. Let's say the feedback of this, let's say that we have an open loop gain of one million. So what does that mean? What does open loop gain mean? So if I did the following. And this has a gain of 10 to the 6th. V out is equal to this voltage, V in minus this voltage, which is what? times 10 to the 6. Does everybody see that? This is always true for op amps. Now, in our op amp, you might have a gain of 1,000, but this is still true. It'd be V in minus these two voltages, the difference, the V plus minus the V minus times 10 to the 6. Does everybody see that? It's the same in this case. But if I ask you, what's the gain of this amplifier, you're going to say nearly 1. And we're going to explain why. Let's do it two ways. And then we're going to talk about your project and how you know how to, to specify the minimum open loop gain. So let's say this was one volt. The input's one volt. And let's say the output was 1.1 volt. 
That's not right. But if I look at the difference, 1 minus 1.1, what do I get? Minus 0.1. I multiply that times a million. This voltage then will try to go towards minus 10 to the fifth. Does everybody see that? So, but its output swing is limited to V to D and ground. What starts to move? Which direction does it move? Does it move up or does it move down? Yeah. Moves down, right? And as it moves down, what happens? Once it goes to one volt, becomes the same as this, this term goes to zero. When this term goes to zero, then multiplying it times a big number makes the output stay finite. So as this goes to infinity, this term goes to zero. So that's why these always have to be for high gains. So what you just said, you said that uh, V plus minus V minus goes to zero? Yeah, so that's the same as saying V plus equals V minus. Right. It goes to zero. So I get that. So now my thinking is, why doesn't V out go to zero? Like, because zero times anything is going to because, be zero. Because then the gain shoots <clears> to infinity. Well, no. V out will go to V in because... Vn is 1, and then the fedback signal here, so in this case it would be, and I'm going to do an example here, it would be Vn minus V out times 10 to the 6th is equal to V out. So let's see, if Vn goes to 0.99999, that's 1 microvolt if I did the math right in my head. 1 microvolt is 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the 6 is 1. So is it precisely one volt? No, it's 0 0.99999. But for all intents and purposes, it's one volt. Does everybody follow? Now I'm going to do an example. We just did one with the gain of 10 to the sixth. Let's do one with the gain is only 100. So here's the example. I've got one volt, an op amp, V out, and I want you to find actual V out when the open loop gain, open loop DC gain is 100. Tell me what to do. V out equals 1 minus V out. Does everybody agree with that? Or V out equals, let's see, it'll be 1 minus 1 over 100, whoops, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, let's say, uh, no, that's right, it's 1 over this. <laughs> So that would be 100, see that's what I get for skipping too many algebra steps over, uh, here let's not skip the steps. So it'd be V out, and then I, that's 100 minus 100 V out, plus 100 V out <laughs> equals 100. There we go. V out equals 100 divided by 101. Uh, don't say my notes are messy. <laughs> so what's 100 divided by 101? Well, it's going to be point. It's going to be 0.99, right? So what's the error? So it's 0.99, and our input was one volt. It's 10 millivolts or one percent. Everybody follow? Now. Let's say that in your projects, I don't remember what I specified, but I said 1%. You have to have error less than 1%. Is this acceptable? No. No. Because you always want to, when you do an engineering design, you never want to design right to the spec. You always want to design so that there's margin. Nobody ever wants to buy a car that's guaranteed to go 65, and that's how fast it can go, right? You want it to be able to go 105 or whatever. <laughs> or 135, right? If you ever, when you drive 
the high-end cars, and they're very well built, and you're on the freeway, it's very easy. I've done this actually where you get up to 120 and you don't even know you're going that fast because the car doesn't vibrate or anything. Then you look down, you go, holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> that on uh, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, any questions on this? So let's talk about the input part. Does everybody understand and you can explain here? Now I know why the two inputs have to be the same. Now I know what open loop gain is and I know how to relate it to calculating what the output is. Nothing is magical here. Come on, is it magical? I mean, it's understandably magical. Okay. It's like taking potions in hair of Hogwarts, right? Oh, they were magic before, but now I understand how roots and what was the the root you pull out with the screaming head one mandrakes. mandrakes yeah see i should know that all right <laughs> you know the thing i wondered in that picture is what the hell is butter beer <laughs> how are kids drinking butter beer anyway the uk i don't know yeah Let's go on our high school break and go have some butter beer. Yay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to sketch a basic op amp circuit here before I go any further. And then we're going to focus on this part right here. Okay. So this is the basic op amp. And I'm assuming everybody knows where this comes from or this. We can actually tie these together. And let's just tie it to <coughs> V bias 4 in our bias. What's that? Source. Say again. Yeah, these are. So these would be two in parallel so that I get the total current down. So this would be, here, let's just put in our sizes. We'll do it real simple. And use the long channel process. Looking good? Does everybody follow that? Yeah. Okay. So, if this terminal goes up, what does it do to this transistor? Turns it on. Turns it on. So what happens to this terminal? Anybody not follow that? Anybody follow it? Okay. What does it do to this device right here? So what does the output do? Does everybody agree? So which terminal on the input of the op amp is this? Is this the plus or non-inverting or the inverting? Yep. Does everybody agree with that? That's the plus term of the op amp. Okay. Now, if I call, I'm going to do this side in just a second. If I call this gain of this diff amp A1, A1 times V plus minus V minus is equal to Vx. What is V out over VX? Let's put the magnitude since we already labeled these plus and minus to ensure the output goes up and this goes up. So this is why we're the stuff we look, you know, I every time you guys take a class or I get students in, I'm like, they're used to learning something and then not using it. Because everything we learn in this class, we use over and over again and use it to do. Does everybody agree that's GMR out in parallel with R out P? Yeah. So if I ask, and I call that A2, and I ask, what is AOLDC in terms of A1 and A2? And let's call that V out over V plus minus V minus.
What is AOL in term DC in terms of A1 times A2? Yay? That's easy to find out. I just solve for Vx here. Vx is equal to V out divided by GMR out in, which is A2. Here. Um, and what do I get when I move that over? Yeah, so it's just A1 times A2. Is everybody cool with that? So if this stage had a gain of 100, in this stage had a gain of 100, what would the open, uh, open loop gain of the op amp be? Ten thousand, right? Does everybody follow that? Okay. So you say you decide I'm going to start on my project and I'm going to do this. Say you decide I'm going to do this and I'm going to put a one k resistor here. Explain to me why that's bad. Yeah, this will go from a hundred down to like point zero one, and then your overall gain will be one hundred times point zero one or one. And it won't behave like an op amp. Does everybody follow that? So I can't do that. I need to add a buffer here to isolate the resistance and the capacitor. Okay, before I leave this page, any questions? So would, for a buffer, would we do like we did for our 421? Well, you could use a... Well, you can use the source follower, and then we'll cover later in the class additional types of more complicated, more efficient buffers. But for now, you could just put a source follower here with the gain of one, and then that would be able to drive the resistor and the capacitor. Okay, so what I want you to tell me, I want you to show me or discuss why this is the inverting input of the op amp. So let me ask this. If the inverting input of the op amp goes up, what happens to this voltage right here? Okay, before I do anything, I know if the inverting input of the op amp goes up, this voltage goes down. Just like I did here. If this voltage is too high, it's 1.1, it feeds back around and causes the output to go down until it hits 1. And the two inputs are the same. I don't want you not taking this class and not being able to describe why the two inputs of the op amp need to be at the same voltage. Now, I'm going to say that. Am I really telling the truth? Are the two inputs at the same voltage? No. Not quite, right? But for all intents and purposes, when you do design, 0 0.99999 is one volt. You're going to have noise that's microvolts. You're not going to be able to measure that voltage. You have noise from radio waves. It's going to be a microvolt. Okay, so now, if this goes up, or actually, let's do it the other way. Let's do it with uh, this node. And let's do it like this. If this node goes down, what does it do to this guy? If it shuts off, what does it do to this node? If this shuts off. I had a current flowing through here, so I might have had 3.5 volts there, but now I shut it off. There's no current flowing through it, so this moves towards V to D minus the threshold. This is, everybody follow that. I got a pressure flowing through here. I shut off the valve. The pressure drop across this goes to zero. So that means the pressure here rises to whatever this is. If this node goes up, what does it do to this one? It turns it off. Well, if it shuts off, and I still have the same amount of current flowing down through here, what does it do to this node? It goes down. If it goes down, what does it do to this transistor? It turns it on. And what does it do to the output? Yep, so my input, my non-inverting input going high, causes the output to go high. And my inverting input going low causes the output to go high. Then I can go back here and I can say, well, let's quickly do this one. This node goes up. What happens to this node? I turn this on more. causes more current to flow through here. The pressure across the device 
increases and this node goes down. If this goes down, what does it do to this transistor? What does it do to this node then? And what does it do here? And then the output goes down. Any questions? Yep, yeah, but let me, I want to finish. We have quite a bit to discuss here. So, and I want to do one more quick variation of this that I want you to see. Before I do that, I want you to imagine I have a capacitor here, which I'm going to call CC for compensation. I'm going to call this node 1 and this node 2. And I'm just going to say, we'll cover this more in greater detail later, but if I want to break this capacitor up onto this node, tell me what I can write here as the capacitor. Uh, it's A2, which is approximately just CC, right? Okay, so now I'm going to go redraw this output part of the schematic on the next page, and we're going to talk about slew rate. So here's the output side. And I'm going to draw this load as CC. Does everybody know I broke it up using Miller's theorem? And then I'm going to have it as, well, let's just leave it as CC. Okay, so you're, we'll skip to the point where you're in a job interview and this node goes up and they ask you, it goes up and shuts this off. What does the voltage on the capacitor do, V out and Y? So this is a simple problem because it tests on fundamentals and it makes you, oh, okay, it goes through and it tests on circuit one fundamentals. And we went over this already, okay? So, oops, this goes on, this shuts off, sorry. If this shuts off, in your brain, you remove the circuit and then what is this? The current mirror or current sink. So whatever the bias current is here, we'll just call it I bias, is constant. It's constant and then V out is going to change at a rate where a constant current is discharging a capacitor. So when you interview, they often will give fundamental questions hidden in circuits like this. So if I ask what does the output do, the first thing you do whenever it's constant current charging or discharging a capacitor, you don't use your brain, you write on the board when you're being interviewed, I equals C D V D T. The next thing you write is you go, I is constant, C is constant, my voltage here across the capacitor is, what is the voltage across the capacitor? V out. Well, if I have dV out dt being constant, what does my output look like? Yeah, it's going to be like this, right? And the slope here is I bias over C. So the slope, the derivative of the slope is what? The derivative of V out What's the derivative of V out with respect to T? I bias over C. I'm just asking you simple questions. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just seeing if you know the fundamentals. So I got I bias over C. Is everybody cool with that? So now let's throw some numbers in. Does anybody not follow? When I do this, and we'll do sims later in the class, I will see V out do the following. We'll do it in this chapter out as well in examples. I will see V out do this. If this is shut off, what's the minimum value that V out will go to and why? Wait, wait. Assume that just it'll either be, depending if you want this to stay in saturation, it'll be VDS sat. But if it stays shut off, it'll discharge to ground until this doesn't have any current flowing and it shuts off. Don't 
There's no magic here, so don't make it hard. Make sure you follow what's going on and you can discuss. Okay, does everybody follow that? So let me throw some numbers in. The minimum voltage is, well, if this stays shut off, the capacitor, this is the way I would answer it. If this stays shut off, the minimum output voltage is going to be ground because it's going to discharge the capacitor to ground. If it's an op amp and I want everything to operate saturation, then my minimum op amp output voltage is VDS sat. It's the voltage I need to keep this current source in saturation. Does everybody follow? You have situations where your, uh, you have large input signals and something will saturate and then it won't ever be able to go to the value it needs to go and it'll shut off. That's undesirable, but it will go to ground. But if you want it to say in linear region, if you were saying, if you were writing a data sheet for the op amp you design, which you will be doing, and you ask, what is the output swing? The output swing assumes that everything's staying in saturation and operating as an analog amplifier, and that means the out minimum output swing is the minimum voltage across this current sink, which is VDS sat. Everybody cool? Okay, so now let's throw some numbers in just to see what happens. Let's say that I bias is 10 microamps, and C sub C is 10 picofarads, reasonable values. So what is I bias over C sub C equal to? So that means if I was at 3 volts and I asked what's the maximum rate that I could discharge to 2 volts, it would be, how long would it take me? 1 microsecond. Now, this is called a slew rate limitation. Because my, if I put in a pulse, if I do this simple thing like this, and I put a pulse in here from 3 to 2 volts, it looks like this. And I ask, what does the output look like? The output's going to look like the following. In other words, it's not going to go from 3 to 2 as quick as the input because the, it's slew rate limited. The fastest it can go is this current source charging the compensation capacitor. Any questions? Okay, so this is for constant current source discharging. Do I have a slew rate limitation for going positive? Do I? If I crank this down, because it's not going to a bias voltage, turns this on, right? And then pulls the output up quickly, because it's not a current source charging the capacitor. It's me pulling this node down, turning this transistor on, and pulling the output up. So, I don't have a slew rate limitation going positive, just a negative. So you do your projects, and I think the slew rate you need to have is, uh, uh, what is it, 100 millivolts per nanosecond or something like that. I don't remember what it was. But you show me only one pulse, like it going up or down, and I look at your structure and I say, hey, they're not showing the problem, which is the current sink. Does everybody see that? You have to show the slew rate both ways. So then you would, in this case, you would come back up to 3, and then you would see it go back up like this. Okay, so let me summarize this. Slew rates are related to constant current sources, charging and discharging capacitors. They're a, 
a term used to indicate the maximum rate the output can change. We have slew rates because we have compensation capacitors and we also have load capacitance that could be large and contribute to the slew rate. So I would, initially I was going to put C sub C plus CL here. I decided now we'll just stick with C sub C. So it limits how fast my output can change. Okay, we're probably going to visit this again in the next, in chapter 24. Okay, but I want to make sure that you can start on your projects and you know what to do and all that stuff. So now let's go back to the diff amp and talk about input common mode range and diff amp output swing and all that other stuff. So this is going to be easy because you've had such high quality instruction and you're going to remember everything you learned because it was important and you're going to use it over and over so you don't have to learn everything from scratch. So I'm going to define this term input common mode range. Oh, and speaking of jobs, Last month, I, IEEE has a magazine called The uh, Spectrum, and I got my copy of The Spectrum in the mail, and I opened up the back, and I'm not kidding, there were maybe a thousand jobs and semiconductors in the back, mainly from like Intel and others. So uh, the problem is you'd have to move, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, when I say that about job interviews and stuff, I'm not, uh, one thing I found is when you, uh, if you found several things. One, a lot of times people will defeat themselves because they don't have self-confidence. So they'd be like, I can't apply for a job there because I can't do anything right instead of trying, you know, and studying and doing the interview and all that. The other is once a company finds places that has a good education in a certain area, they will continue to go back and hire more people from that place. And so we've got people going into certain companies this May that unfortunately aren't in Vegas again. But I'm hoping they will shine so that the companies will come back and hire more of our graduates. Plotting, eh? No, that's why you go to school. You don't go to school to say, I got a degree. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, <laughs> what's that? No, that's the job, though. The job is to make sure that you provide an education that's relevant, right? Unless you don't want to do your job, I mean. All right, so input common mode range. I'm going to call this CMR. Would everybody agree with me that when I'm designing an op amp, these two are the same voltage? Okay, so... They're at the same voltage, so when I talk about common mode, I'm talking about these two voltages here. So I'm going to ask you, what is the minimum voltage I can have on the input of this diff amp? What is CMR min? You know this. It's VGS plus... And notice I don't get confused with which one am I looking at because they're at the same voltage, common mode voltage, plus VDS sat. Any questions? Should I confuse things and write this as, oh, well, that's V threshold plus two VDS sat. Is everybody cool with that? You know this, right? Okay. So now, let's do the common mode range max. Okay, so, yeah, that's right. But I need to cheat a little. I need to help myself a little. So what do I do first? I'm going to write this voltage, which is... Does everybody agree with that? Now I know that if I drive, so tell me intuitively. Well, tell me intuitively what happens here. I just said it and assumed everybody knows. If this goes 
below the minimum input common mode voltage, what happens? These start to drop. So what happens? They shut off. So the current, does everybody see that? So I start to drop, this current, this voltage here will go down, the currentness will decrease, and the diff amp will shut off. This is, when you get an op amp, this is what's happening. There's no magic here. Maybe bipolar transistors instead of MOSFETs, but it's the same exact thing. Okay? So now, I'm going to tell you how to do the maximum, but I, I've labeled this drain voltage VDS VSG sat. And now, let me pause for a moment. If these two voltages are the same, what can I say about these two VGSs for DC? They're the same. If they're the same, assuming everything's in saturation, what can I say about the two currents? They're the same. Well, what can I say about the VSGs here? So wait a sec. We have the same VSG. We have the same I bias. So what do I know about the VSDs? They got to be the same. If I hold the drain currents the same, if I hold the VGS is the same, then there's no other place for this to be but the same voltage. So what is my output voltage then? What is this output voltage right here? It's the same as this one. It's a mirror. This is mirrored over here. And in fact, when I did my biasing, I assume for biasing purposes that this voltage, this voltage is the same as this. So this basically performs a current mirror operation as well. So in my mind, when I'm biasing, I don't think of, oh, well, this is going to be at the same potential as this. Okay, so now I know this drain voltage is VS, VDD minus VSG, and I know for this, oh, so if I raise these voltages really high, what happens to these transistors? They turn on a lot, or they triode. So they stop behaving like amplifiers, and they start behaving like resistors. And so I think, oh, I got my current mirror here. Go on to my current sink. We'll make this times two, or we could draw two in parallel so we get the 2i bias through here. And then once we get 2i bias, these two into resistors, well, they don't really do anything. It's just a resistor connected between a current sink and the current mirror. So I say, well, I don't want these to triode. So I know that VDS has to be greater than VGS minus V threshold N. And I'm going to write this, and you tell me if you agree. That means V drain has to be greater than or equal to V gate minus V threshold N. This is VD minus VS. This is VS, VGS, uh, VG minus VS. So I just get rid of the VSs, right? So I can write that now as VDD minus VSG has to be greater than or equal to VG minus V threshold N. But what is another name for VG when I'm doing the common mode max? VG is this voltage here, right? If I'm trying to figure out what the maximum value of VG is, it's going to be yeah, VDD minus VSG minus V or plus V threshold N. Now make a, a comment about this. <laughs> no, the comment is the input common mode range can go pretty close. It can go roughly uh, VSD sat if V threshold P and V threshold N are the same. It can go very close to VDD. So if my design spec is an input common mode range that's very close to VDD, I want to use an NMOS diff amp. If it's very close to ground, I want to use a PMOS diff amp, which I'm going to show in just a second. Okay, so having said that, are there any questions? So you said that this, the diff amp is our input to our op amp. 
right? That's the circuit on the input of the op amp. So we're going to have our BMR circuit. We'll have a bias, maybe a BMR if that's what you design. And that's going to the diff amp. And on the second stage gain. Is our op amp? Yeah, that's the op amp. Oh, and then we're going to have a buffer on the op amp. Yep. It's good. You're thinking of us assigning projects you couldn't do, right? Yeah. <laughs> the other thing about doing projects is when you write your resume, you want to make sure you have projects, right? I may have told you this, that you can list on the resume, I did this project, I did this project, so that when you go into interview, they can discuss the projects. And then you, they can ask you, well, show me what your op amp was. Why'd you pick this NMOS stage? And then you can discuss it. Well, the spec was an input common mode range, which was this, and so this met that spec, and so that's why I use that. Good, eh? Plotting. <laughs> okay. This, I can't remember this equation, so I have to think about it every time, and I went through the thought process of how I think about it. I go, well, what's this voltage? It's VDD minus VSG, and I write this equation, then I get this. This one, I can remember, because it's just VGS plus VDS sat. If I modified this and put a Cascode current sink here, how would it change? Assume wide swing cascode. So I had two transistors here in cascode. So you have another Yeah, it'd just be two VDS set. See all we use that? Minimum voltage across the current, compliance range, whatever you want to call it. Now we're using it over and over again. Okay, so let's do an example of a PMOS and then we'll quickly, if we have time, do an AC gain, because you're going to cover that in the next lecture, which is on Thursday, which is already online, since we won't have class on Thursday. But chances are we will have a quiz on Tuesday, because we're not having one today. I'm like, should we have one today? No. <laughs> time. It's the eat class time. That's the problem. Okay, so I'm going to draw, and let's do this a little differently. Actually, let's do it not to confuse you, but just so you get used to looking at different circuits. V bias 1. And I want to just assume table 9.1. And I want you to tell me what the max input common mode range is. Need to have a minimum, assuming wide swing bias, of two VSD sat. And I need to have a VSG across this. Boom, I'm done. Is that challenging? Okay. So then, as I said, what is these two voltages here and here? Because we have the same current, same VGSs. So what is that voltage? VGS, right? Now, because I'm learning... I'm going to write source, drain, source, drain, and I'm going to write for the min input CMR. Here? So they have the same VGS here, right? That's the same as that voltage there, right? Right? And then I've got the same current flowing through each, so then the drain to sources have to be the same. Okay? Well, I get really confused, like, why is this, why is not VDS going across the current? It is. So VDS is going to VDS. Yeah. For DC biasing. You can convince yourself. Draw the, the plot. I have ID. And then I have a curve that looks like this. I have the same ID in two transistors and the same VGS. Then the VDS has to be the same in the two transistors. There's not any way it can move or change. 
VGS has to stay on this curve. ID is fixed and both transistors are exactly the same, so the VDS has to equal the VGS. Okay? So then I go min input common mode range, and then I'm going to say, okay, for this transistor, VSD has to be greater than or equal to VSG minus V threshold P. And I'm going to skip a step here and write VD has to be less than or equal to VG minus V threshold P, or plus V threshold P. So I, it's VS minus VD, VS minus VG. These cancel, and I multiply both sides by negative 1, flip the quality, get VD is less than or equal to VG plus V threshold P. Okay? And then I know that VG then has to be greater than or e equal to VD minus V threshold P. But what is VD minus V threshold P? So wait, how low can these two inputs go, the common mode input range? They can go low, right? Because this might be 1.2, this is 0.9, or 1.05, so the inputs can go down to 0.25 volts, almost all the way to ground. So if I want an input that can go all the way to ground, I use a PMOS diff amp. If I want inputs that can go all the way to uh, VDD, I use an NMOS diff amp. If I want all the way to ground and all the way to VDD, I use them in parallel, which we'll talk about later. All right, let's do one last thing. Is I want to derive the AC gain for the diff amp. And I'm going to use this topology here. And I'm assuming we're operating in, uh, in uh, saturation. And I'm going to derive the AC gain for the PMOS diff amp. And I'm going to do it real simple. I'm just going to draw a current source here to be different. I'm not going to show the DC biasing. And why don't I make it confusing and call this V2, V1, and then uh, V out. And I want you to find V out in terms of V1 and V2. How much AC current flows in here? Zero, right? It's a DC source. No AC current flows. So I'm going to write this as VSG1. I'm going to write this as VSG2. I'm going to write this as GMP times VSG1. I'm going to write this as GM times VSG2. And I can look here, and if I do a KCL here, what do I end up getting? Yeah, I get GMP VSG plus GMP VSG2 equals zero. Or... Everybody cool with that? So everybody see how I did that? So now let's do our circuit skills. Plus, minus, V1. Plus, minus, V2. I want you to tell me how to write the KVL around here. Wait, when I do KVLs, I just look. On one side, if I'm going into minus, that's what I write first. Then when I go into the minus again, notice how I write the plus and minus to give myself a crutch so I don't have to think. So then it's VSG1. But now I go into the plus, so I can either put minus on this side or I can put equals and put them on the other side. But can I rewrite this as V1 minus V2 equals what? 
Well, if I move them to the other side, it would be minus 2VSG1. It's just putting in here positive, uh, right? And can I then write that as minus 2 times ID all over GMP? I'm going fast because we're running out of time. Or the current flowing in here, ID is V1 minus V2 all over uh, GMP over 2. And that's mirrored over here, so that's the same current, V1 minus V2 all over GMP over 2. And then the current that's flowing through here is the same exact thi thing as this, but backwards. So when I add them together, I get, what's the total resistance on this node? R out N in parallel with R out P, I get V out over V1 minus V2 equals GMP times R out N in parallel with R out P. And that's a little too fast, I realize. However, you'll see it in the next lecture. Have a good day. We'll see you later. Would you hit the light on the way out, please?